On Sunday evening, as we were getting ready for bed, something unexpected happened. Jeanette, my wife, had been acting a little off all weekend. I had asked her several times if she was feeling okay, but each time she reassured me that everything was fine. Despite her words, I could tell something was troubling her. To be honest, I had my own worries too. The Great Recession had hit us hard, taking us from a place of financial comfort to barely scraping by. It seemed like none of our friends or colleagues were doing much better, but Jeanette was having a harder time coping with it. She had grown up in a wealthy family, and the lifestyle we used to have, including vacations and extras, was slipping away. Although she never directly blamed me, I could feel her frustration and subtle complaints about our finances. I held her close and told her how much I loved her, but she didn't respond in the way I expected. Instead, she stood up and poured herself a glass of whiskey, a strong one, without even offering me any. It was a clear sign that she had something important and probably upsetting on her mind and was gathering the courage to tell me. We sat through dinner, but I couldn't focus on the television. My mind was consumed with worry. We headed upstairs as usual, which usually signaled a moment of intimacy between us. But tonight felt different. I could feel the distance between us, and I knew our relationship was being affected by everything that was happening around us. As I finished brushing my teeth, Jeanette entered the bathroom. Someone at work invited me on a ski trip to Colorado, she said, almost casually. It's all expenses paid. One person in the group had to drop out, and the tickets are non-refundable. We leave Wednesday morning and return on Monday. I paused, toothbrush still in hand. Someone at work? I asked, my voice a little tighter than I intended. The way she said it made me think it was a man who had invited her. She looked guilty, almost like she was trying to hide something. I think you just answered your own question, she said quietly. I couldn't hold back the flood of questions. Who is this man, Jeanette? The one who invited you, a married woman, to go on vacation with him? I tried to keep my voice steady, but I could feel the tension building between us. He's not someone you know, she replied. But I felt confused. I thought I knew everyone you work with, I said, trying to understand. Jeanette hesitated. You know him, but we don't work directly together. I'm not sure what's confusing about that. I pressed her. You said someone from work. Who exactly invited you? She sighed, clearly uncomfortable, and finally said, I met him in the cafeteria. His office is on the fifth floor, and we've had lunch together a few times. I was struggling to keep calm, but the disappointment in my voice betrayed me as I asked, Since when have you been having an affair? The question hung in the air, and before she could answer, Jeanette started to cry. Between sobs, she said, I would never cheat on you. How can you say something like that? I couldn't hold it in any longer. Maybe you forgot to mention that you've been having lunch with him or that you're such good friends now that he invited you on a ski trip, a married woman, to Colorado. And by the way, we haven't been intimate in nearly a month. My voice cracked, frustration and sadness flooding my words. It's not what you think, she protested, wiping her tears. He's just a really nice guy. His girlfriend couldn't go and he doesn't want to lose the tickets. It won't cost me anything. The hotel's paid for, the lift tickets too. It's all taken care of. Isn't it convenient? The weight of her words settled heavily between us. My heart ached as I tried to process everything. So, what's his name? I blurted out. The words slipping out before I could stop them. John? Does he even have a last name? Johnson, Jackson, something like that? Jeanette's eyes flashed with irritation. You've annoyed me so much. I can't even think straight anymore, she shot back, clearly frustrated. So you want to fly halfway across the country with a man whose name you don't even know? I said, my voice rising. You're either sleeping with him or you're just being naive. The tension between us was thick and the argument escalated quickly. Who exactly are these friends you're going to be rooming with? I asked, trying to hold on to my composure. They're friends of John's, she replied flatly. Two other couples. The other two couples? Does that mean you're going on a date with him? I couldn't help the sarcasm creeping into my voice. No. Jeanette answered, her frustration mounting. He doesn't want to waste a non-refundable ticket. So he asked a married woman to go with him. Why don't you trust me? She paused, then asked. Would you believe me if I told you I met a woman at the coffee shop and she invited me to go on vacation with her? I scoffed, a bitter laugh escaping my lips. 
Yeah, right? Remember last summer when you got so jealous when I explained the fly ball rule to the woman sitting next to us at Wrigley Field? You got so upset we were kicked out of the room. My voice softened as I recalled that night, but the anger still simmered. This is different, Jeanette. Her face flushed red, and with a sharp cry, she snapped. Oh, and you won't be able to ignore me when you're sharing a cabin with John and four complete strangers. With that, she stormed out of the room, leaving me standing in the silence of our bedroom. It was a long, restless night. Jeanette and I lay awake, tossing and turning in our bed. The clock seemed to mock me, ticking away the hours, until exhaustion finally overtook me at 2 a.m. At 6 a.m., I dragged myself out of bed and made a pot of coffee, the bitter aroma filling the air. Jeanette poured herself a cup, took a sip, then dumped it in the sink. I'm off to work, she said curtly, her tone icy. I knew Jeanette well enough to understand that when she dug her heels in, she would rather lose than admit she was wrong. She was stubborn to a fault, the most stubborn person I had ever met. As I headed to work, a plan began to form in my mind, a plan to save my marriage. But I knew reasoning with her wouldn't work. It was going to take something drastic. As my grandmother used to say, a good, swift shove in the right direction. About a year ago, I had taken a chance on a street-smart young man named Julio. He'd been in trouble with the law before, but he had a certain grit to him that I admired. He was always reminding me how grateful he was for the second chance I'd given him. Tell me what you need, boss, and I'll get it done, he'd say without hesitation. And today, I needed him more than ever. I met with Julio and explained my situation. I need your help, I said, my voice low. Tell me what you need and consider it done, he assured me. I laid out the plan. I need you to gather information on a guy named John. I'm giving you a photo of my wife and her office address. I need you to find out who he is, what he does, everything. Get a picture of him and find out where he works. Julio nodded quickly, the determination in his eyes evident. Don't worry, boss. I got this. I'll follow him like a shadow. At 5.44 a.m., my phone rang. It was Julio. Boss, it's me. I got the photo, he said, his voice tense. I saw them talking, but I couldn't get close enough to hear what they were saying. He continued. I followed him to the elevator, and he didn't even notice me. He went to the fifth floor and went into room 510, the office of Anderson Metallurgical Supplies. Good job, Julio. But we're only halfway there, I said, trying to keep my focus. I'll keep following him, boss. Don't worry, Julio assured me before the call ended. I quickly opened my computer and typed in John and Anderson. Dozens of results popped up, but none of the names matched the face in the photo Julio had sent me. Frustrated, I tried, Jace, but still nothing. My heart sank as I realized I was hitting dead ends. I decided to search Anderson Metallurgical Supplies, LLC, and was surprised to find out that the company was one of the largest suppliers of powder metals. But there was no list of employees on their website, and that only deepened my frustration. I called the company's number, hoping for a breakthrough. Hi, I'm looking for a John Johnson, I said, trying to remain calm. The voice on the other end told me there was no one by that name. Embarrassed, I quickly corrected myself. Okay, how about John Jackson? Again, no luck. My heart sank. Was I even on the right track? I apologized and hung up, feeling more defeated than ever. By 7.05 p.m., I was sitting in front of my computer, staring at the screen. My fingers hovered over the keyboard, but I couldn't shake the feeling that I was getting nowhere. I needed answers but it seemed like every road I tried was a dead end. Just as I was lost in thought, the phone rang again. It was Julio. I felt a wave of both relief and dread wash over me as I listened to him update me on the situation. After we finished the call, I headed toward the men's room, still processing everything. To my surprise, as I walked in, guess who followed me in? None other than Robert Jensen. Or at least that's who I thought he was. But as I watched him closer, I realized none of these names he'd used were real. Did he notice you? I asked, my voice low, barely above a whisper. No, boss. He was hiding in one of the stalls, Julio replied. I watched him through the gap between the wall and the door. He never saw me. I could hear the tension in his voice as he spoke, a quiet sigh escaping him as he finished his task. 
He didn't even bother washing his hands as he left the restroom. A man about my age walked in just after Julio left, and he greeted the man as Mr. Jensen. That's when it hit me. This wasn't the man I thought he was. This wasn't the John Jackson I had imagined. When I finally had the chance, I approached the man. Hey, was that John Jackson? I asked, trying to stay casual despite the knot in my stomach. The man looked at me, then shook his head. No, that was Robert Jensen, he replied with a shrug. Seems like a real jerk, if you ask me. But hey, I wouldn't get too close. Julio's voice echoed in my mind as he added, You're getting pretty good at this. Thanks, boss, Julio said, his voice filled with pride, even though the weight of the situation still hung heavily in the air. Unfortunately, my day didn't slow down. I was sucked into a long logistics meeting that drained all my time, leaving me no chance to dig deeper. I'd have to wait until tomorrow. As I pulled into the garage later that evening, the phone buzzed again. It was Julio, his voice excited yet calm. He had more news. Boss, I saw Jensen leaving the building just before 3 p.m. I followed him unnoticed into the parking lot. The train was packed, so I had to sit at the opposite end of the car. Jensen looked freaked out, clutching his briefcase like he thought someone was going to rob him. I followed him until he got home. My heart skipped a beat. Where does he live? I asked, unable to keep the urgency out of my voice. He's at 2366 North Kimball Avenue. A basement apartment. It's a mess. There were bars on the windows, but no curtains. I could see everything inside. Julio sounded both curious and wary as he spoke. He came out again with a stack of pizza boxes, threw them in the dumpster, and then came back with garbage bags. I grabbed them, boss. People always throw away their personal stuff. Can't let it go to waste. By the time he hung up, I was already pacing. This was it. I needed answers. At 8.57 p.m., Julio called again. I still couldn't figure out who Jackson Johnson really is. But I did find something interesting. The documents I grabbed list him as Robert Jensen. Looks like our mystery man is playing more than one role. I felt a mixture of relief and frustration. Julio, you did great. But I can't keep talking now. We'll pick this up tomorrow. The next part is the hardest. I couldn't hold back anymore. I had to confront Jeanette. I sat across from her, who was casually munching on a burger and fries at the kitchen table, trying to maintain my calm. In order for us to have a real conversation, I need some things. I started interrupting her as she opened her mouth to speak. I could see her face tense, but I wasn't backing down. I need John's last name, address, email, phone number, where he works, copies of the plane tickets, and the address of the chalet he rented. If something happens to you, God forbid, I can't tell the police I let my wife go to Colorado with someone I don't even know. I need answers. She tried to protest, but I raised my hand to stop her. No, I'm saying it now. I always used to annoy you by speaking first, and now, you'll hear me out. I also need the names and numbers of the other couples going, I added. Then, you can speak. Her expression softened just a little. He didn't actually rent the chalet. It belongs to his uncle. And John doesn't even have a cell phone. Can you believe that? Even kids have cell phones now. She paused and gave a small, nervous smile. If I gather all this, will you stop accusing me? You have one day, I said, my voice firm. And admit it, you're jealous. You're angry that I'm going to Colorado. You can't hide it. Jeanette's face flushed, and she let out a frustrated sigh. I swear it's not like that, she exclaimed, clearly defensive. But fine, I'll get the information, and if everything checks out, we can talk. That night, we slept as far apart as possible on our twin mattress. The distance between us felt more like miles. But when morning came, Jeanette was unexpectedly calm. We even had coffee together in silence, a thin veneer of civility between us. I arrived at the office early, pacing the floor, the weight of the situation heavy on my shoulders. I needed this to end. When Julio arrived, he brought a large cardboard box. I watched as he sorted through the contents, casually discarding what he deemed trash financial documents, bank statements, and even a letter from a lawyer's office. He carelessly tore it in half, thinking that would stop anyone from stealing his identity. I couldn't help but wince at the thought of how easily people carelessly throw away things that could ruin them. I carefully taped together everything that looked important and arranged it in order. 
This was it. The truth was out there, and I was getting closer to the answers I needed. Julio wasted no time in presenting his findings. The first thing he handed me was an envelope large enough to hold legal documents. It had been sent by certified mail to a man named Robert Jensen. As Julio explained, Jensen had been to court for non-payment of child support, failing to provide for his two small children for over a year. This negligence had led to a warrant being issued for his arrest, though the police, overwhelmed with cases, had yet to show up at his house. Instead, his name had been entered into a database, meaning that if he had any interaction with law enforcement, even for something as minor as a traffic violation, he would be arrested. Julio thought this idea was almost amusing and called it a good one as he relayed the rest of his findings. There were overdraft notices, checks that had bounced, and a closed bank account. He also pulled up a flight reservation, noting that Jensen's ticket was round trip, while Jeanette's was one way. That raised some serious red flags. Julio even suggested we cancel both tickets using the ticket ID and had another plan swapping seats so that Jensen and Jeanette would be separated on the plane. In the end, we could control as much of the situation as possible. As Julio dug deeper, he turned to the Chicago Tribune archive. There, he discovered something shocking. Jensen was using an alias. His real identity was tied to a past criminal conviction, a charge for sexual assault that had occurred in Denver. Despite the crime happening in Denver, Jensen was originally from Chicago. His face, along with the story, had been published in all three major local newspapers. After a plea deal, he had served time in prison, though his sentence had been cut short due to overcrowding in the system. After only 14 months in prison, Jensen had been released and, upon his release, sought out his ex-wife, only to beat her severely, sending her to the hospital for weeks. Yet, despite everything, his ex-wife continued to defend him, still seeing him as a good man. I needed to confirm every last detail. During my lunch break, I went to the courthouse to obtain a copy of Jensen's divorce papers. For just 25 cents a page, I got a copy of the arrest warrant for his assault. I also spent time at the law library, finding a template for a divorce filing based on adultery. I filled out the form and attached photos of Jensen and Jeanette taken in a cafeteria together. Photos I had taken myself. Once everything was in order, I went to Cook County District Court, where I filed for divorce, armed with the forms, certified copies, and a case number. I let my boss know I needed a few personal days, and, without asking any questions, he gave me the time off. When Jeanette came home that evening, everything seemed normal. She began cooking dinner like she did every night, though this time, it felt as if she was putting extra effort into it. She seemed to be trying to make things right, trying to cheer me up. I walked up behind her and gave her a warm hug, kissing her softly on the lips. Her reaction wasn't quite as enthusiastic as I'd hoped, but it was better than indifference. She pulled a piece of paper out of her bag and handed it to me. I got everything you asked for, she said. I took the paper from her, my mind racing with questions. As I told you, John Johnson doesn't have a phone number, but I did find his email address. You can also find him on Facebook. She paused before adding, he's been promoted recently and is waiting for new business cards. Strangely, he couldn't remember the name of the company he works for. I looked at her, unsure how to react. I felt both frustrated and perplexed, but I kept my cool. Grabbing my laptop, I quickly opened Google Maps and typed in the address of the chalet. I hit the first hurdle almost immediately. The address didn't exist. I tried again, this time using Denver's official zoning map but nothing came up. I was growing more suspicious by the second. Honey, I said, frustration creeping into my voice. We've hit a snag. I've tried six different mapping programs, plus the assessor's website, and they all say the address doesn't exist. Johnson might have given us the wrong one. I turned my attention to the tickets. He said we'd pick them up at the airport, right? I asked. No, Jeanette replied. We'll get the boarding pass at the airport. The weight of everything was starting to sink in. We were supposed to leave soon. But the more I uncovered, the less I trusted this whole situation. My mind raced as I wondered what more I could uncover. Would this trip really be the escape Jeanette had promised? Or was there something far more complicated lurking beneath the surface? Sure, I muttered, my mind racing back to that trip to Maui. 
The memories were bittersweet, and now everything seemed clouded with suspicion. I decided to verify the information that Johnson had given me, so I called the numbers of the other two couples he had listed. My stomach sank as I discovered that neither number worked. I searched for their names online, but came up empty-handed. Even Facebook couldn't provide any leads. Honey, I said, trying to keep my voice steady despite the mounting anxiety. I regret to inform you that none of the information Johnson gave us, if that's even his real name, seems to be true. I won't let you go through with this. I expected Jeanette to see the same glaring inconsistencies I did. Instead, everything spiraled out of control. In an instant, my dinner, still sizzling in the pan, was launched across the room and smashed against the wall. I couldn't help myself. It's a shame. It smelled really good, I muttered, trying to lighten the tension. Her face contorted with rage as she screamed. You will not stop me. Who are you to dictate where I go? I'm your husband. I shouted back, fighting to keep my composure. Why are you being so unreasonable? I'm just worried. You're about to go skiing with a man who's lied to you about everything. You don't even know where you're going. And he hasn't been honest with you. Maybe he's worried you'll spoil his plans. Jeanette, consumed by fury, couldn't contain herself. Stop saying that, she yelled, her voice shaking. We'll always just be friends. I'm going skiing. And you can't stop me. If you want to go too, fine. But how can you afford it? We're broke, remember? I bought two cans of silver coins when I was a teenager planning to use them for our fifth anniversary. Her words hit me hard, though I couldn't fully process the pain at the moment. I'm going to cash them now, and either we go on vacation together, or I'll hire a divorce lawyer. The choice is yours, she added with a bitterness I hadn't seen before. I clenched my jaw, trying to remain calm. I'm not threatening you, Jeanette. I'm making a promise, and you know I always keep my word. I don't understand why you don't trust me. You're an amazing woman. But Johnson has been disrespectful to you. He's ignoring your husband's concerns. You're about to go on a trip with him, and I'm not just going to stand by and watch. I could feel the walls closing in. I told you he'll only take me because the ticket is non-refundable. I'll refund his ticket money, and we'll still have enough for the trip. But it's too late now. We leave tomorrow, and I can't reach him. Her eyes were full of defiance, but I pressed on. You're making a choice, Jeanette. You're choosing him over us. Over our marriage, the tension was suffocating, and I could feel my chest tightening with every word. She didn't answer me, and I spent the night on the couch. I could hear her sobbing in the bedroom, and as much as I wanted to turn my back on her, something inside me wouldn't let me. My mind waged war with my heart. The logical side of me wanted to let her feel the consequences of her actions, to let her suffer when the inevitable fallout came. But the emotional side, well, it couldn't let go. I wanted to save our marriage, to fight for us. I spent the entire night tossing and turning, trying to figure out what to do. In the end, I made a decision. I would compromise. I had to. I woke up before dawn, hoping I could somehow make things right. But Jeanette wouldn't even look at me. She was packing her things when I quietly entered the room. Why did you take a picture of me? She snapped. What's wrong with you? So the police have an updated photo in case they need to identify your body. I answered, my tone flat. The words were harsh, but I couldn't help it. They hung in the air, thick with the tension between us. She responded with a series of angry words, but I was too numb to hear them clearly. I walked into the room as she continued packing her suitcase. If you go with him, I won't be there when you return, I said, my voice firm. Our marriage will be over. Her eyes met mine with disdain. I know you're not stupid enough to do that, she sneered. It's interesting, though. I thought the same thing about you. Seems we were both wrong. Without another word, she left. I watched her drive away, the weight of the moment pressing down on me. I went back inside and began to shave my beard and mustache. It felt like I was preparing for a funeral, and maybe in a way I was... I put on my black suit, the one Jeanette used to call my funeral suit. It felt fitting... Our marriage, it seemed, was about to be buried. I grabbed my briefcase and a few suitcases, packing my things with a quiet sense of finality. As I was about to leave, my phone rang. Julio's name appeared on the screen, and I picked it up quickly. Boss, you won't believe this, Julio said, his voice low. I'm standing next to Jensen's apartment. There's been a fight. 
Your wife tried to offer him a ride to the airport, but he insisted on taking the subway to save money. She even offered to pay for parking, but he refused. He said they'd need the money for the trip. I stood there in silence for a moment, processing his words. Every new detail just made things worse. As I watched Jeanette disappear into the bathroom, I couldn't help but feel a sinking sense of dread. While she was out of the room, I seized the opportunity to discreetly go through her purse. My hope was that she wouldn't use our shared credit cards, but I had already canceled them after buying my own ticket. I had to be sure of everything, and trust was growing thinner by the minute. I imagined myself as a silent observer, inside Jeanette's mind as she descended into the underground maze of the Chicago subway. The blue lights flickered above, casting shadows across the dimly lit station. It was early in the morning, and the blue line was packed with commuters rushing to work, each person locked in their own world. My stomach twisted as I thought about her going on this trip, especially with him. Julio had voiced his concerns too. Anyone heading out for a winter vacation in December should have a proper coat and gloves. Yet Jeanette seemed unprepared for what was to come. The subway ride was long, just over 30 minutes, but it felt like an eternity. Julio followed them discreetly into the terminal, keeping his distance as he observed. I couldn't shake the feeling that this was all spiraling out of control. At TSA security, things seemed to get even more tense. A security officer flagged Jeanette's carry-on bag, asking her to step aside for further inspection. It turned out, Jensen had been clever enough to hide a corkscrew in her bag, trying to sneak it past security. My heart raced as I waited for the results. To my relief, the search yielded nothing else of concern. The corkscrew was confiscated, and Jeanette received a stern warning. As the situation unfolded, I couldn't help but feel a deep sense of dread creeping in. But I couldn't afford to lose focus. The timing had to be flawless for my plan to succeed. Thanks to my early boarding, I was one of the first to get on the plane and take a middle seat. Jeanette, of course, opted for a window seat. I hesitated for a moment, but decided to try one last time. I called her over, asking if she would sit next to me so I could show her something important, something that might change everything. As I looked around, the rows ahead began to fill up, and soon, the passengers were scrambling to find room for their carryouts. The chaos that ensued was almost a relief. It gave me space to breathe. But just as I thought the tension might ease, it escalated. Jensen, holding his ticket tightly in hand, bumped into my seatmate. The man, probably a college athlete judging by his build, was quick to defend himself, pointing out that Jensen's seat was further back, closer to the bathrooms. What followed was a storm of frustration. Jensen erupted into a tirade about the airline's incompetence, demanding that my seatmate vacate his seat so he could sit next to his girlfriend, Jeanette. I couldn't believe my ears. Jeanette, turning around to pack her bag, glanced at the argument unfolding. The aisle-side passenger, trying to stay out of it, made it clear that Jensen was in the wrong. But Jensen wasn't having it. In that moment, Jeanette suggested I ask the middle seat passenger to switch. Jensen, oblivious to my identity, thanks to my lack of beard and sunglasses, didn't seem to recognize me. But the flight attendants arrived soon after, stepping in to defuse the situation. One of them scolded Jensen, telling him to sit down so they could finish boarding. She promised they would try to accommodate him after takeoff, but the flight was nearly full. Finally, Jeanette noticed me sitting there in the middle seat. The anger on her face was undeniable. She turned to me, and in a flash, her words cut deeper than I expected. You've ruined everything, she snapped. You've ruined my vacation, and now I hate being married to you. Those words struck like a blow to the chest. It felt as though my entire world was crumbling in that moment, but I had to hold on. I stood frozen, gripping my briefcase. My mind was swirling, trying to figure out my next move, but then something happened I hadn't anticipated. Jensen started waving his ticket in front of my face, a smug look on his own. Without thinking, I grabbed the ticket from his hand. My hands were trembling as I handed it to Jeanette. Read it. I asked, my voice almost unrecognizable. She took the ticket, her expression unreadable, and glanced at it before asking, Who is Robert Jensen? I was about to respond when I suddenly realized something was off. The ticket wasn't what I expected. 
There was nothing there. Disappointment hit me hard. And in frustration, I crumpled the ticket and shoved it into my pocket. But my actions didn't go unnoticed. The flight attendant, who had been standing nearby, noticed the commotion and instructed me to take my seat immediately. I tried to ignore her, caught up in the whirlwind of emotions and the chaos around me. But as I sat back down, I couldn't shake the feeling that everything was slipping through my fingers. In that moment, everything seemed uncertain. Would Jeanette believe me? Or had I already lost her? The moment Jensen lunged toward Jeanette, demanding to sit next to her, something inside me snapped. A rush of emotions flooded me, and I could feel the hot sting of tears on my face as I tried to keep control. I had been holding it all in, but this, this moment was unbearable. How dare he call my wife his girlfriend? As the tension mounted, I handed Jeanette the papers I had gathered, my hands shaking. I asked her to look at the evidence, showing her the arrest warrant for Robert Jensen, detailing his past and the horrifying truth about the man she had trusted. It was hard to breathe as I explained the gravity of the situation, the one-way ticket, the lack of a return flight, and his history of violence. Her face shifted between disbelief and confusion, but the weight of the evidence was undeniable. She started asking questions, desperate to understand, but Jensen, focused entirely on his own drama, refused to engage. As he ranted against the flight attendants, I showed Jeanette photo after photo of the woman he had hurt, explaining his violent past in stark detail. Still, Jensen ignored the truth, caught up in his own anger. I tried to reach Jeanette, asking her to speak to him, to call him by his real name, Robert Jensen, but she remained silent, the fear and confusion evident in her eyes. I could feel her pulling away, and a coldness settled over me. I had been trying to protect her, to save her from a man who had only ever seen her as a tool to further his own desires. But in doing so, I had nearly destroyed everything we had. Then it happened. Jensen, furious beyond reason, screamed that he would kill me. My body reacted without thinking, narrowly dodging his blow, which instead struck a flight attendant. The chaos erupted. In an instant, the aisle was a battlefield, the passengers frozen in shock. But one man, a quarterback from a major university, jumped into action, restraining Jensen before the police could arrive. As they dragged Jensen away, I could see the satisfaction in his eyes. He had caused enough destruction to leave a mark. The media would later call the quarterback a hero. But for me, the situation was far from over. The airline upgraded my seat to first class, a small gesture to ease the chaos, but it felt hollow. Jensen's actions had ruined everything. And even as he was escorted off the plane in handcuffs, his screams echoing, I couldn't help but wonder if Jeanette would ever truly understand the depth of what had happened. When the police finally arrived, they separated us into different interrogation rooms. Homeland Security was involved, and I was left alone with nothing but the stale taste of cold coffee and a growing sense of dread. What was happening? Was my wife truly involved with Jensen? Or had he been trying to destroy us, to manipulate her into a web of lies? The detective returned with the chilling news. They found evidence in Colorado, he said, and I saw the change in Jeanette's face before he even finished speaking. Her eyes went wide as the photos of a rundown cabin appeared before her. The truth hit her like a freight train. Jensen and his friends had planned something far worse than I could have ever imagined. They were going to harm her, to use restraints and sedatives on her. The weight of it crashed down on her and she fainted, her body collapsing in shock. I had saved her life, but at what cost? The man I had once called my wife seemed like a stranger now, broken by the truth. I stood frozen, unsure of what to do. A part of me wanted to walk away, to serve her with the divorce papers I had been carrying, but another part of me couldn't bear to see her in such a fragile state. She needed someone, even if it wasn't the same someone who had once loved her without question. The detective tried to convince me to tear up the papers, reminding me that Jeanette needed me now more than ever. My heart wavered, torn between my anger and my lingering care for the woman I had shared so much with. I decided to speak to her, but I couldn't ignore the painful truth of what had happened. I told her I would rip up the divorce papers if she sincerely apologized, but even as I said it, 
I knew things could never be the same again. When Jeanette entered the room, her face hidden behind trembling hands, I saw how broken she was. She collapsed into a chair, her sobs filling the room. The detective's voice was stern, reprimanding her for the consequences of her actions, but I could barely focus. My own emotions were too overwhelming. This wasn't the life I had planned. This wasn't the future I had imagined. And yet, I couldn't leave her. Not like this. Not after everything we had been through. Even though my love for her had faded, the man she had married still existed in me, somewhere deep down, wanting to protect her, no matter what. Mrs. Mennell, the detective began, his voice carrying the weight of decades spent in law enforcement. In my 29 years on the job, I've never encountered something like this. If anyone deserves to be hurt, it's you. His words hit like a hammer. And though I could feel a surge of anger and disbelief, there was also a strange sense of compassion for my wife. How had we arrived at this moment? The road ahead would be long, filled with tough decisions and painful realizations. But for now, all I could do was stay by her side, trying to offer a semblance of stability in her world that had crumbled to pieces. He looked at her one last time before leaving the room. Thank God for your husband and every heartbeat he gave you. You owe him the rest of your life. When he was gone, the room fell silent, save for Jeanette's sharp, broken gasps between her sobs. Not a word was spoken in reply. Not a thank you. Not an apology. The weight of her silence felt like a slap in the face, but I couldn't bring myself to walk away. Not yet. I stood there, unable to hold it in anymore, the pain and disappointment too overwhelming. After a few moments, I finally broke the silence. You betrayed our marriage for a ski trip that cost less than $1,500. That's the price you put on everything we built. How am I supposed to trust you now? How can I believe you won't leave me for the next shiny trinket? My voice cracked. My heart shattered with every word. I needed some kind of answer, some sign that she felt the weight of what she had done, but she didn't respond. Her silence was deafening. Tears streamed down my face, but I couldn't stop. The anguish I felt was too much to bear. If you had just said sorry, Jeanette, I whispered, my voice breaking, I would have torn up the divorce papers. But I can't wait anymore. I handed her the papers, watching as her eyes widened. When she read them, her scream filled the room, a sound so raw and filled with pain that the detective rushed back in, worried about her. I've already packed my things, I said quietly trying to keep my emotions in check. Anything left behind is yours to keep or throw away. I'm done. I handed her the keys to the apartment, the place we had once shared, and walked out without looking back. The weight of it all hung over me, but I couldn't stay. Not anymore. The next time I saw Jeanette, it was in court. The judge had ordered us to attend counseling sessions, but in my heart, I knew there was no hope for reconciliation. I agreed reluctantly, but deep down, I had already made my decision. I wasn't going to forgive her. During the counseling sessions, it became painfully clear to the counselor just how far gone Jeanette was. She didn't understand the damage she had caused, the lives she had torn apart. As I had expected, the counseling didn't help. Seven months later, I was free. Free from the chaos, from the pain. And I never heard from Jeanette again, which, in a way, was a relief. I didn't want to. Jensen, meanwhile, had been charged with conspiracy and attempted criminal mischief. He was convicted and is currently serving his sentence. While part of me wished for some kind of justice, the truth was nothing would ever truly make this right. 